What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Comedy Pop-Up Podcast. We have a couple live shows coming up on December 5th. We're going to be at the Common Space Brewery in Hawthorne, California. And on December 11th, we're going to be at the Ha Ha Comedy Club in North Hollywood. For more information on those shows or any of our future shows, please check out our website, ComedyPopUpLA.com. And this week on the podcast, I had the great pleasure of interviewing Frank Cronin, who is a dope comic who is going to be doing a 500-mile walk from San Francisco to L.A. for a great charity that helps out homeless people. And to support him, please check him out on Instagram, at GlowPunk. And also check out the hashtag Rough Set to keep up with him. He said he's going to be posting GPS coordinates of where he is currently on his walk. So please check him out. This is the episode Comedy Pop-Up with Frank Cronin. Well, welcome everybody to the Comedy Pop-Up Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Paul Antonio, and I'm joined by uh, an awesome guest. He's from Dublin, right? Dublin, yeah. Ireland, born. Uh, Mr. Francis Cronin is here. Hey, thanks for having me, man. What's this up, man? It. Yeah, we, we were just uh, getting to know each other before the show. It was like a speed dating. Yeah, and then we decided let's save some of it for the uh, the interview. Yeah. we. I, <laughs> I, I like the space, dude. You got to... You gotta, Comedy pop up is a grown brand. I like it. Yeah, man. It's a little. Uh, I mean, it's our little shoebox in Koreatown, yeah. but it's something that we're proud of. And man, we're just happy that comics are willing to come <laughs> to come over here to record. Yeah, you guys are getting numbers too. I was yeah, checking you out online. You're getting some big names in. Um, yeah, yeah. I feel lucky to be on. So yeah, thank you. that is comedy pop up, not pop up comedy, which is uh, the rival. <laughs> which no, oh, it's funny. Wow. We had a. The, there's a lot of uh, like groups that like pop up. Yeah. That are like uh, their names are kind of similar, yeah. but then they just kind of like fizzle out. Yeah, that's like it happens really like you know it's like capitalizing on a name and then it kind of. I mean, we did rip off the Converse logo though, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. our logo looks pretty sick. Uh, but yeah, thanks for coming to the studio, man. Uh, so I guess let's get into it. Um, you're here to promote uh, a walk that you're gonna do, and I am adamantly opposed to exercise, so I'm offended <laughs> just by that. <laughs> but this walk is in, it's called the Rough Set, right? And it's a 500 mile walk from San Francisco to LA. Yes. And it's for charity. I assume I assume it's not on a whim. No, well well here here's here's a funny thing. Here's the real truth. I wanted to walk the 500 miles from San Francisco to LA, do uh -huh. comedy and storytelling along the way. Uh-huh. And every time I told people that I wanted to do it, they'd say, "Yeah, but what are you doing it for?" And I yeah. go, "Cuz I want to do it." And they go, uh -huh. "Yeah, but what are you doing it for?" So I asked my dad, I go, why do you think I'm doing it? He goes, you're probably doing it because you're not sure you can do it and you want to prove to yourself you can do it. Uh, and, then he, and then he goes, but yeah, like you're going to have a big platform. And I've always, I've always been fascinated with uh, uh, how people get themselves into a predicament where they're living on the streets. And uh, I also know a few people who have lived on the streets and uh, aren't doing well or haven't done well. So I thought, ah, I'll use this platform to draw attention towards homelessness. And yesterday, actually, thanks to a friend of mine, I've hooked up with a charity and uh, I'll be able to release the name of that next week because I'm not, it's not signed off on, mm -hmm. but uh, I'll be able to raise money and attention for a homeless charity. So yeah. Cool. That the charity legitimized your walk. Yeah. Yeah. I was hoping you didn't like just watch Forrest Gump one day and you no. were like, that's well, that, what I want to do. That definitely played into it. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm inviting people out to walk with me for sections of the walk. So mm -hmm. if they want to walk alongside and, uh, have a chat. Yeah. I'm hoping to have loads of comics walking along and then we'll yeah. end at a place and do comedy at a place. And That'd be so dope. So what are you most, I would say, if if you're nervous at all, but what are you most nervous about on this walk? Um, picking up an injury, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, just repetitive strain injuries from doing 25 miles a day uh -huh. uh, on average, which is pretty much a marathon a day. So mm -hmm. you can, even if you're fit, uh, which I've been working on, I'm pretty fit right now, probably the fittest I've ever been. The chances of not picking up some sort of injury on the way are pretty slim. Mm -hmm. So uh, between diet, nutrition, stretching and all things like that, I'll be super focused on just that. The comedy side of things and storytelling and wondering if people will come out, I'm not too worried about, weirdly. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like the idea is big enough yeah. that people will jump on board. It's yeah. all, it's, uh, thankfully, people like you are reaching out and... Uh, like trying to help me make this into a thing. Yeah, man. Well, we're fascinated. Whenever somebody comes out, because I mean, you know, there's so many just like 
normal things in comedy. It's like, oh yeah, I have my new bar show or I have my new day, which is great and everything. But whenever we see something that's like really unique like this, we're like, that's who we want to talk to. We want to talk to that guy. We don't want to talk to the Johns of the world. <laughs> we want to talk. <laughs> sure, <okay. laughs> yeah, our friend John is in the studio here. He's also <laughs> <laughs> he's on the side. He was told he couldn't talk, and we're just gonna rib on him the whole part. See, I don't I don't often have situations where somebody is tied up in a corner <laughs> where you can just address them. So yeah, yeah, no, it's nice. Yeah. Well, John, uh, um, John, hello. Anyway, back to the real interview. So anyway, um, yeah, dude. Sometimes when you when I first came to Hollywood, right, you try to fit into the Hollywood machine. You go, oh, so I got to get an agent, a manager, do loads of auditions, run around town, try and fit into the mechanism that is the existing Hollywood. And then you do that for a few years and you realize, wait, I was way more interesting before I started trying to jump through the hoops of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Like I used to, I lived in a tent for seven and a half months in college, finished my degree while living in a tent. Um, I've cr kayaked across Ireland. I used to do all this stuff for fun, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I thought, oh, why don't I just do what I used to do with a few cameras and friends around and add the comedy aspect in? And lo and behold, it turns in, it's a great hook. Yeah. It'll give me a platform to help others and instigate real change in the world by like getting money to people who need it. It's like, yeah, dude, it's way, <laughs> I used to think, oh, you got to do what Hollywood wants you to do. You don't. I mm -hmm. think Hollywood wants you to be original and mm -hmm. do something outside of the box and then they come to you. Yes. Which is, I think, you know, it's not a bar show. It's a, it's a real weird thing. Yeah. You can't help but go, well, Hey, I got to see if he's still alive, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Hollywood's a cookie cutter and it tries to like, it, it, if like from an outs, like outwards appearance, it seems like they do try to like mold you into a certain kind of like mm. aspect. So it's funny when you go, go to like a lot of open mics and stuff in LA, you see a lot of people doing the same thing. That's like, no, well, this is what they did to get on to this and that. They don't realize that, no, those people were trailblazers at the time that they did it, you know? So, I mean, something like that, like the whole, so wh what were you known as when you lived in a tent? Because it was something. Oh, you, tent boy. You were tent, tent boy. boy, right? So, yeah, final year of university, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have a lot of cash. Mm -hmm. I had some, actually, uh, I had a restaurant. I, I, it's an old story. But I used to have some restaurants in Mexico. I was, uh, like, trying to do business. And so all my money was tied up there and I didn't have cash. So I decided, oh, I'll live in a tent, document the experience from my final year of university, get my degree. And lo and behold, man, just stepping slightly outside the norm mm -hmm. and taking action, into, like just my life into my own hands and documenting it was way more interesting than all this stuff I tried to create on YouTube and Facebook beforehand. Yeah. So before I knew it, there was, it was, uh, it was coverage in the papers and I was um, being invited to talk at different events and uh, kind of uh, as, as a result started understanding how showbiz works mm -hmm. and uh, how you can use it to, uh, you know, as a platform to draw attention to things that are actually important, mm -hmm. which is generally not showbiz like homelessness, yeah. et cetera. So, um, yeah, that, that's pretty much what happened. So seven and a half months, I was called Tent Boy. And uh, it made the national news, the national papers. And actually part of the reason why I got over here, I guess. Yeah. Because I realized, oh, so I know how to play showbiz. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see, how, let's see how much momentum I can get in America in a few years and then use that momentum to, like, change the world, which sounds really uh, generic and kind of like uh, cliche. But, man, the, my inner child is super still alive. So there's a part of me that literally does want to help people. <laughs> yeah. You know I mean? And I commend you yeah. for it because yeah. there's so many people out there who either on purpose or by accident stumble into something that helps them build a massive platform. Yeah. But then they never really know like what to do with it or yeah. they start, you know, they buy the, the flashy cars and everything, but they're never really like pushing for like the greater good and stuff. So yeah. the fact that you're linked up with something that, you know, you made your walk, you were actively thinking oh yeah, this walk is going to launch me into like, like it's going to have a lot of uh, attention to it. How can I use that to benefit something? Yeah. Like that's so important, man. So yeah. Well, just to give a context, when I was about 16 in Ireland, we had this thing called a work experience year, basically. Or mm -hmm. uh, what is it? It's a, it's a year where you go out and you work. And one of my friends was working downtown in the city. So I would uh, go in and visit him. And I met this while I was waiting for him to come out. I think it was every Wednesday. I got talking to this homeless guy who was a poet. But he was homeless by choice, which is, that was the first time I'd ever heard of that concept. Mm -hmm. And then I started watching uh, stuff like Michael Palin's uh, adventures where he travels the world 
He's a, he's the guy from. Um, Anyway, he's a, he's a very famous comedian. He's Monty Python and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he used to travel the world just talking to people. So all this stuff in the back in the back of my mind. And uh, then my dad used to bring us, and my mom used to bring us camping every weekend. We didn't have a massive amount of cash, so we go camping, you know, often in our cousin's farm, like in one of their fields. <laughs> and then we had like the free horse rides and shit. Yeah, but, controlled camping. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, what it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then uh, then I had a a, a cousin uh, who became homeless. Uh, for various reasons and uh, has since passed away. And then I, uh, um, then I, you know, I think actually I lived in the tent before that or maybe around the same time. And uh, as a result of living in the tent for seven and a half months, I became kind of part of the, at least one of the people who hung around with the, the long-term homeless where my tent was. So mm -hmm. I got to understand uh, and talk to a lot of homeless people and be ingratiated into their group and see what it's like to be on the outside of society looking in. Mm -hmm. It's it's fascinating, man. When you're not playing the game of society and trying to keep up with everybody mm -hmm. and you're just sitting outside the local grocery store eating out of a tin of beans, looking at people trying to keep up with the rat race, it's fascinating. Uh -huh. And you realize how dislocated homeless people are from society and, uh, you know, all they generally need is a little bit of help. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, com obviously... Some people are str struggling with uh, psychiatric problems and uh, drug addiction and uh, more complex problems like that. But often you can improve their situation with mm -hmm. just a little bit of help, a little bit of money. Well, it's crazy because homelessness is kind of the transformation. It's almost like there's a certain level of dehumanization that occurs like when somebody like kind of becomes homeless and that's mm. that's by society that does that. So you look at people, I, I remember, I, I think I was watching a documentary or something on this where one of the biggest factors in basically homeless people being stuck like in that life is the fact that you almost become like invisible in society. So yeah. like if you go and you're talking to people like now, like as somebody who, you know, is living that rat race and in that, if I go out and I just randomly stop somebody on the street and I talk to them, yeah. at least they're going to kind of acknowledge me, you know, mm -hmm. whereas if I come out, like approach them as a homeless person and they ignore me, mm -hmm. like what that does to the psyche, yeah. I heard is just something monumental, you know, it oh, just I'm completely sure. shifts it. Yeah. You know, so the fact that you had a chance to experience that, and it's funny, this is kind of continuing a theme that we talked about on the last podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, I had two of my buddies in here. Uh, Orlando Leva and Tamar Catan. Oh, brilliant. Two and great guys. Two great guys. And we talked about uh, like humanization, like how the world's kind of lacking humanity right now where you kind of live in your bubble mm. and because you don't understand other facets of life or other like groups, yeah. you all of a sudden instantly they're the up, like they're the other team or they're the, one of the biggest things that I try to do, like at least in my personal life is have conversations with people who are not in that bubble. Yeah. You know? Um, well, um, you know you're a rarity. Yeah, that is something that's, that's not like... Well, I, I wouldn't, let's not say a rarity, but it, it's almost like it's uh, more important to identify as part of a group now, it seems, than as an individual, mm -hmm. which I think is relatively dangerous territory because mm -hmm. it start, as soon as you start putting people into groups, then it's easy to malign them or decide that they're not in the in-group yeah. and put them in the out-group, and all of a sudden you've got an enemy that you can disassociate from and harm without any feelings of guilt. It's yeah. like it's super, super slippery slope. Yeah. Well, we all know about the dangerousness of like hating people based on their ethnicity or based on, we mm -hmm. know that that's, you know, that's, that's racist, that's bad. But I think the hit, there's a hidden dangerous like level with liking people because of their skin color, because of like their ethnicity. It's like automatically, oh, like, like me as a Mexican dude, like if I see somebody, I'm like, oh, they're Mexican we're brothers, <laughs> you know, that's like me. Right. I feel like that's not, it's not as dangerous. Like it's a, it's definitely a significant level below, yeah. but I think it's secretly and like dangerous to like play into those identity politics. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I think, I, I think you're onto something there. I think the, what I try and, cause I've had this conversation a lot recently, especially in LA, people really want to talk about uh, <laughs> ethnicity oh, yeah. and uh, stuff like that, which is fine. But uh, what I always try and bring it down to is what I practice on a daily basis, mm -hmm. which is, Treat people as individuals mm -hmm. every time. Yeah. And then life is simple. Yeah. That's all I do. Yeah. And uh, as a result, I think people uh, sense that they're being appreciated as an individual, mm -hmm. that I'm not judging them. And lo and behold, people seem to think I'm an all right guy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so like, so that's it. I mean, it's a simple solve, right? Yeah. I'm getting that vibe. The 
the the weirdest thing is when people do make that kind of prejudgment and definitely so this studio we've had this studio for about a year right yeah. and in this studio we've had several hundreds of comics come in and different shows and everything and it's always been bizarre to me the people that come in and see so 99% of the people who come into the studio don't know that I do comedy. They don't know that I'm a comic. I've only been a comic a couple of years. I can tell just Easy. by the way you're dressed. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I am wearing that. the uniform of a hoodie and <laughs> jeans. Hoodie and jeans. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> yeah. uh, so like 99% don't know. So to them, when they walk in, they just see like the audio guy. That's the audio guy. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain level of people that walk in and address me as kind of like, hey, what's up, man? Like, be very welcoming. Okay. And then there is a small group of people that kind of dismiss you as like, oh, you're just the audio guy. Hey, what's up? Like, oh, right. I'm never going to see you. And then it's always funny to run into those people at clubs because oh, yeah. then they're like, oh, wait, you I thought you just did. And then their whole demeanor changes like, no, buddy, you thought you figured me out <laughs> just by meeting yeah. me, you know, like yeah. that whole predetermined thing. I think it's just so dangerous, man. And that's something that I feel like it's lazy. It's, yeah. it's like a laziness. Well, I think people, yeah, people get caught up in themselves and people, um, you know, including myself, you know, that's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not, I, you know what, I might, I might think I'm a great guy and I meet everyone uh, and try and treat them all as great people and individuals, but maybe I don't know that when I'm busy and in my own head, just before going on stage, I might treat someone uh, less friendly than I treat the headliner mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I always, I always try to keep a level playing field. I remember here. Here's a good story, dude, because you're from Mexico, Guadalajara, right? Uh, well, I'm not from there. I was born here, but my family's from there. So oh, right. Yeah. Well, I used to live down in Guadalajara, Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, actually for like six or seven years on and off trying to do these bars. Uh, one was called Temple Bar. Mm -hmm. It's an Irish bar, one of the cool streets, you know, for bars in, in Guadalajara. And uh, so I have this uh, a work ethic that I, that I have to clean, you know, in my bar. Mm -hmm. Like I don't mind cleaning tables. But that wouldn't be the norm for an owner of a bar to clean tables, say, in Guadalajara. It's not the societal norm. So when I was cleaning tables, people would treat me a certain way. Mm -hmm. As soon as they found out I was the owner, I was – they can change completely. Yeah. And I was their best friend, and they wouldn't talk to me in the same way. They wouldn't be uh, aggressive with their orders, you know, or tell me I was slow or whatever, you know. Yeah. So yeah. It's fascinating, you know. Yeah. People, people uh, are very reverent to status. Mm-hmm. Uh, partly why we do this, I guess, man. Yeah, right. Uh, as we grow our perceived status in the world, mm -hmm. then people will treat us better, and that's pretty, pretty nice feeling, right? Yeah, it's it's insane. You know what? So I I read something the other day that kind of changed the way that I think about everything. Yeah. And it was just a simple stat. I think it was on like Reddit or something, and somebody posted it, and it just said that everybody knows a different you. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. then all of a sudden you kind of break that down, and you're like. Oh, yeah. Like when you leave today, you know exactly who you are, but you were never thinking about like, oh, now Paul knows a different me just for meeting me for like one day, you know? Yeah. Like it's it's just this insane concept of you really can't control because as performers, we want a certain image to be like perceived. We'd like people to like us. Like, yeah, that's absolutely. Psychology 101 for performers, right? Mm -hmm. There's some co some comedians who say they wouldn't like it, but nah, it's not really no, true. We all want it. But once you realize that you have no control over that, mm. I feel like it makes your life easier. Oh, yes. And, and I think what the most stressful thing I think for a performer would be to be misrepresented as something they're not. Mm -hmm. Like... Um, Something like as if they were made out to be evil or mean. That's why, like, even in this business, it's such a like if you're if you were raised right and you just treat people right, mm -hmm. I think you get pretty far on that. Yeah, it's when people try to be heroes and try and do way too much and they overcompensate, then that people are like, "Hey, that guy's a bit weird." And you can sense yeah. it. it's like just a be human and uh, you'll yeah. do all right. Just be genuine. Yeah. So right, I want to circle back to the he temple says bar. as he covers up his obsession with uh, people's <laughs> opinions. <of him. laughs> right? Yeah. It, it's true. It's, it's overwhelmingly good. true. <laughs> but I want to circle back to the temple bar. So what yeah. made you choose Guadalajara? And my friend married a Mexican girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had just left the army. I mm -hmm. was in the United Nations um, and they had paid me what's called danger money. Mm -hmm. which is when you, We call it danger money in the army. See, I went to Liberia, West Africa in 2005. And as a result of going into a dangerous uh, into dangerous territory, you get like double wages. Wow! So I had all this. What I perceived was all this cash for mm -hmm. a young a young uh, twenty seven year old kind of broke dude. So I thought, oh, I, I've got this money. My friend wants to open a business in Mexico, and her family, the family he was marrying into, had a chicken wings restaurant. So we go, 
oh, we'll buy a franchise over there. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, that went well. And about three years later, we opened a, um, the Temple Bar, which uh -huh. was like outside the franchise, which gave us more control. Yeah. And that went on for a few years. And uh, there was a hostel. We opened a hostel as well uh, for foreign students. And uh, yeah, all with varied success. Like we never, we weren't, we weren't printing money. But in terms of like, say, uh, in terms of Mexican standards, uh, I could live pretty comfortably. Mm -hmm. But then when I tried to live in Ireland, mm -hmm. making my income in Mexico, um, it, it was pretty tight, you know? Yeah. And um, he wanted to educate. So we pulled out of Mexico there because he wanted to educate his uh, his kid in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, mainly because the school where we grew up is really nice. That's it. Yeah. So that's the only reason we sold up, really. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And that area, I mean, so like I said, my family is from Guadalajara, so like, that area is like, I mean, it could be kind of rough at times and there's still like corruption and stuff. Did you ever experience any of that or? Ah, uh, well, yes. <laughs> uh, yes. You know, um, okay. So a uh, <laughs> few stories uh, down in Mexico. Uh, one time, one time I was uh, taken to an underground jail cell and uh, they tried to extort money out of me. Mm -hmm. uh, but luckily I knew more devious people than these people. So uh -huh. I got out of that. And uh, I had done nothing wrong, <laughs> which is the reality. M many times I would get pulled over and, uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and extorted by uh, unfairly pay paid police officers. Because yeah. the police are paid so little. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not really, <laughs> I can't blame them. Oh, yeah. My oh. family, we were in a taxi <laughs> yeah. and the cop came and pulled us over yeah. and looked in the back of the taxi and saw us. And we all had our seatbelts on. And the, the cop just says to the taxi driver, they're not wearing any seatbelts. Oh, yeah. And we had him on, but it's like, what are you going to do? Yeah. Like that. So we had to pay the cop cash. Oh, yeah. Just to get like then and there. It's, oh, yeah. No, yeah, it's, it's a little more Dida, they're called. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then you got to deal with the Ayan Tamiento, which is the local council. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you just need, we were lucky. We knew uh, some people further up the, the food chain, I guess. Yeah. Um, but there was one time, I'll say it uh, without mentioning names. One time I went to cover a bill uh, with a friend of mine. And we went into this nightclub, you know. I didn't know why we were going into this nightclub, but it was his bill and I was there as his backup. We walk into the nightclub and we're in the back office. And as we walk in, the guy behind the table tips on the wall behind him on a little, uh, there's a, an article, most wanted drug dealer in Mexico. And it's him. It's the picture of him. Uh, so, yeah. So we got out without getting our money back. But mm -hmm. we got out alive and we were happy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I have so many guesses as to who that person could be, but I'll ask yeah. you after. Well, he's dead now, but I still wouldn't mention his name in case. Uh, yeah. For various reasons. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you after, <laughs> yeah, after yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> we'll ask. Yeah. Um, Sounds like Valencia. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, let's get, let's get out of Mexico and let's get back to the rough side. So yeah. I'm, I'm interested in... Oh, by the way, just on Mexico, dude. Greatest place I've ever lived. Most yeah. beautiful people, most mm -hmm. hospitable people. They have everything from the uh, most beautiful jungle in the world. Actually, I, I lived in the jungle with this uh, in indigenous people near the Sotano de los Galandrinos, which is a big hole in the earth where the swallows come out every morning. That was like, it, it's beautiful. And then they have the most beautiful beaches, the most, my God, the girls are incredible. The food is incredible. The music, the culture, everything about Mexico is great. The, mm -hmm. only, the only thing that I noticed about Mexico is when it comes to trying to do business and mm -hmm. there's money involved, it's it's a little bit hard to steer away from the governmental corruption. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, Mexico, number one yeah. place on the planet as far as I'm concerned to live. Well, everybody knows the territories that certain groups control and any money that goes through that territory, a little little slice of it needs to yeah. be donated. <laughs> well, you, you can you can live uh, you can live outside of that machine, mm -hmm. outside of that uh, paradigm, uh, but as soon as you start doing business, um, generally people will show an interest people will come yeah. knocking and uh yeah. point to pictures on walls yeah so all right let's get let's get out of mexico let's go to uh back to the to the walk <laughs> yeah right because i'm interested in this so you said that you're going to be walking on average 25 miles yeah 25 day. yeah um so how does it work for the comp do you have a venue set up like every 25 miles or? no so no actually so i'll probably only do about 10 shows on the over the 30-day walk mm -hmm. so the first i think the first show will be uh either in the Punchline or the San Jose Improv, and I'll just be dropping in on someone who's already doing a show. Yeah. And I'll call in a few favors for friends to ask, can I do, drop in and do 10 minutes? Yeah. And then as we walk down, hopefully, 
because this thing's getting a little bit of press, we'll be able to collaborate with some people and maybe do like, oh, hey, Frank's going to be through here in two days. Let's do a garage show with local comedians from the area, invite people around, do a bit of storytelling, have a bit of music. It's like um, creating the party as we go. So mm -hmm. it's true collaborations. I'll be getting gigs. And then as I get down to L.A., because I'm working in tandem with uh, Dynasty Typewriter, the new club. In yeah, Canada. which is fantastic. Dynasty Typewriter yeah. is like, that's the place to check out. It's like the new hip. It's kind of, you know what it reminds me of is like a, a little Largo. Yeah. That's what it reminds me of. Yeah, people say it. I, I, uh, I, I think we're killing it over there. Yeah. Nice. So, they're, yeah. Uh, so they're helping me produce this thing. So they're going to probably help produce a show or two on the way down. Mm -hmm. And then when I get back into L.A., and between you, me, and your listeners, it looks like we're going to have a sleepover at Dynasty Typewriter after some comedy and storytelling from wow. the trip. So that'll be kind of cool. Yeah. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of shows along the way. Another guy yesterday, dude, no, day before yesterday, a guy reached out. Uh, when I, he says when I'm walking through San Jose that I can drop by the airfield and he's going to take me in a flip in a plane. So people are allowed to offer experiences and stuff like that, and then yeah. we'll document them and grow this baby. Yeah. Well, how can people, let, let's just say it in the middle and then we'll say it again at the end, but how can people contact you if they want to have any part of it or oh, maybe send some recommendations your way or send you some uh, oh, experiences? Yeah, thanks, dude. So if you guys are on social media, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, just look up Francis Cronin. It'll um, Just by way of reference, it is uh, the little blue verified one, Francis Cronin, ginger, crooked-toothed man. And uh, just send me a message, say, hey, I have this cool idea. You want to do it? And I'll probably say, yeah, and then we go and do it, dude. So if you guys want to throw on a show, if you want to walk with me, if you want to uh, do a little interview, if you want me to drop in on your podcast, man, I'm going to be working all day, every day to get the word out as much as possible. And I'm happy to, the attention I'm getting and the media attention I'm getting, I'm happy to put it on your, uh, on your thing. I'm mm -hmm. happy to turn the spotlight on you. So, you know what I would love to see if anybody out there is going to be in the areas that you're walking through, I'd love to see somebody walk up next to you with a zoom recorder yeah. and just do a podcast while you're walking. Well, that's ideal. Yeah, that's ideal. Or here, here's another thing I've been saying to people. Mm -hmm. If you're a video, if you're a video crew mm -hmm. and you want me to be in one of your videos, we can collaborate and make a cool video. Like anything goes, I'm all in mm -hmm. as long as it's within a few miles of my trek because I'm going to be tired. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> they don't the problem is I'm sleeping out rough every night. So my energy is uh, somewhat like uh, rationed. Now, is that on purpose? Or are you taking beds if somebody offers one? Um, no, I'm not taking beds. That's a uh, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And you'll also be able to track my movements online via GPS. I'll be uh, pinging myself. Mm -hmm. There'll be plenty of video evidence that I'm not sleeping <laughs> inside. Um, it's not a Bear Grylls <laughs> situation. No, no, that, that guy. Yeah, he's he's a nice guy, but he's he's doing he's doing it at a corporate level. I'm yeah, doing, I'm true. doing this at a grassroots level. I also, I am, um, I love this stuff, man. I grew up camping. I was in the army, I was sneaking around uh, doing some fun stuff. So th this to me is a uh, it's in my makeup, I think. I mm -hmm. enjoy this stuff. It excites me. And uh, I also want to, I've, I don't know where this fascination comes from, but uh, I know a lot of, uh, as a result of this fascination, I know a lot of people who live rough mm -hmm. uh, from my experiences and so on and so forth. And uh, I want to understand what it is to sleep out repeatedly at mm -hmm. night in the cold winter. Yeah. Yeah. Now, are you limited to a tight, like, time window? Um, mainly because mainly I got a show in Vegas on the 10th of January. Oh, okay. yeah, but yeah, yeah, Otherwise, no, I just have to get back by the, I think I'm aiming to get back by the 7th. Mm -hmm. And then in February, <laughs> uh, if, depending on how this goes, mm -hmm. um, I, I hope, in February I have to go to France. I'm doing some gigs in, uh, with a guy called Kev Adams. He's a French Yeah, comedian. Kev Adams, great guy. We met him. Uh, he did a comedy pop-up show one time. Oh, he's, he's great. Yeah, he's oh, a yeah, great yeah. Guy. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we must get him on here. He'll be back in January. Um, but yeah, I'm doing some shows with him. He's letting me open for him. So I got to memorize 10 minutes in French. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, but then, Oh, so it's in French. Yeah. Wow. Then depending on how this rough set walk goes, I think somewhere next year, please God, will do L.A. to New York. Wow. Instead of walking, though, I've uh, been in contact with bird scooters, and they're yeah. going to give me a scooter. Okay. So that's a, that, should, that could be cool, man. It's good that it's a bird scooter, not like a Razor scooter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like one of those Toys R Us $20 scooters. Yeah. That would be, that would be amazing. Do you like camping? I, so, 
I do like camping, but I don't get to do it often. You know what I'm obsessed with on YouTube? What's that? Are all those camping and survival videos and fishing videos. I watch fishing on YouTube for hours at a time. I think that's a primal thing. Yeah. Like we're attracted to see, we're attracted to that. It's something innate. In the same way, like we we either like girls or guys or whatever we're into, Mm -hmm. where we can't not look at a fish getting reeled in. Yeah, like, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm sure there's some people going, what are you talking about, dude? But I think it's true. Yo, it's it's insane if you think about it. It's like, what do you watch all day? I watch people catch fish mm. or catch, yeah, catch fish. I almost said catfish. Catch fish, then gut them, then cook them, and then eat them. Oh, no, no. You're a psychopath then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, you're, no, you're <laughs> off the range. Yeah, no, we're doing fine on you. You mentioned the gooding. Yeah, and then yeah. people pull back and they turn off the radio. Yeah, they were so. like, "All right, we're done with it." But like, yeah, when you really think about it, you're like, "Am I just watching a dude eat?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on, on <laughs> so, am I, is this a fetish? Am I <laughs> All right? Yeah, yeah. But it's like, no, I want to know what eel tastes like. It's yeah. like, come on, yeah. So I don't get to do it often, but I mean, my cousin goes camping all the time. I always message him. I'm like, "You yeah. got to take me with you." But yeah, that's that's part of this walk too, man. Like, I, if I don't know exactly why I want to do it, but I don't know any any guy. Mm-hmm. Or I, any girl that wouldn't like to spend a lot of time walking, yeah, and just like not worrying about society and the pressures that it puts on them to pay their rent and bills. Yeah, dude, I'm walking. L- listen to how freeing this sounds. I'm walking with nothing but a small backpack, a cell phone, and some cash in my pocket. I have nothing to worry about uh-huh. except where I sleep at night, and I'll be so tired by the time I get there. I'm gonna sleep like a baby. Dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I get to make go. content with just random strangers uh-huh. shared over the world, build a brand, and hopefully create some sort of, this is the dream, right? Create mm-hmm. some sort of ph- phenomenon where I can go, hey, dude, uh, Paul, I'm going to go play the improv in the Ontario tomorrow. You want to come with me? Yeah. Okay. We're walking, by the way. And then by the time we get there, there's 200 people there. You yeah. Know? Like we create, that's it. Like we create our audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? That's, that's, but, and true. that's, that's comedy now. Yeah. Comedy now is no longer, you know, people, it almost seems like this, and correct me if, if you disagree, but it almost seems like comedy used to Wrong. be- Wrong. No, okay, sorry. Right? <laughs> sorry, dude. Sorry. <laughs> uh, comedy um, used to be like, oh, we're going on a date night to the comedy club. We're going to go see who we see. Okay. But now it's like, they won't go to the club unless, unless they know the comic. They watch the comic on YouTube. They they get an eight. Oh, they, they, and then they decide whether- after watching that comic online or seeing his content, if he's then worth to go see live or stuff like it, that's new age cut. You have to create your own audience. See these, yeah, there's people putting 200 people in seats from podcasts alone. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know what you, I don't know what your numbers are, but it's like the, the level at which people are uh, communicating with their fans is really deep right now. Mm-hmm. Like these headphones, people listening to this podcast Probably listening on headphones at the gym, walking, lumberjacks in the forest. I don't know what they're doing. Truckers. Fishing. Driving, fishing, people <laughs> fishing. But it's going straight into their ears. It's a very intimate connection. Mm-hmm. Like in the old days, maybe if you didn't get Johnny Carson, then nobody knew who you were and you didn't have a career. Mm-hmm. Now you can like, you can build loyal fans mm-hmm. and build a great rapport with them and actually enjoy, like you can be completely yourself and then come find you. Mm-hmm. In the old days, I think you had to kind of be this thing and pray that you fit it into the slot. Now there's yeah. a slot for everyone. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is an intimate relationship that we have. And like the the listeners, it's, and I don't know if people have come up to you and just like started talking to you about facts about your life that you're like, wait, I don't, you're a complete stranger. How do you know that about me? Yeah. But then you realize that, oh, it's because of my act. It's because of my podcast. It's because of something like that. Yeah, that's weird. When someone quotes something that you said in a podcast that was only a, a slight reference. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also, I dated a girl who uh, listened to every podcast mm-hmm. and it was, a, it actually kind of messed up our relationship because she mm-hmm. knew way more about me than I knew about her. And uh, she would like regurgitate my opinions to me, <laughs> straight to me. You know? Yeah. It's kind of funny. It's, yeah. That's before I said them to her, she was able to say, yeah, but you said, remember in that podcast that you didn't like long term <laughs> you, know, you know you're just like that's oh my funny God. when it affects like that little yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're like i'm a changed man from 2016 yeah, or something yeah. like that do you think we're oversharing podcasts like I, we, we're i mean i think we innately since we are content creators at the very core that's what we want to do is just create content for people i think since we create so much content even if it's just a podcast talking to people for an hour every week yeah. 
you kind of have to go deep into the well mm-hmm. to get stuff. Oh, I have this story that, you know, I could talk about this. And, I mean, just through podcasting, and I've been doing shows for years now, since like 2010. Mm-hmm. Um, I've probably shared almost every, you know, every breakup I've ever had, every this, every that, talking stories about like, you know, whatever's happened in my life. To the point where I have no clue what people know <laughs> about Dude, me. And also you probably, you're, if you had a dedicated listener that's listened to everything, mm-hmm. they know more about you than your own family and friends. Oh, for sure. How crazy is that? For sure. Than my parents. Yeah. It's, it's like, I mean, so I'm 25 and I mean, there's so many things that my parents didn't even know. I've been doing, I've only been doing stand up like two and a half years, but yeah. They barely saw me for the first time like a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. Like it was to the point where there were absolute strangers who would come up to me. And I used to do a joke that was like it was it was just some some dumb joke about like a baby and like a girl. Oh, got my girl stolen by a baby, whatever. And I had a girl come up to me at a bar and she's like, hey, I know you. And I was like, what? And she's just like, yeah, you're the guy who had his girl stolen from him by a baby. Yeah. And that was such like a weird story for them to know about me. But I'm like, my parents don't know that. Like, yeah. they don't know that side of the story. Like, yeah. it's insane. It's insane. But I think it's also important that people realize that that it's such a one way conversation because obviously we're not hearing their stories that like if they do come up to like if they come up to somebody and then they get mad at a reaction that that person has. I, Oh, as, as if if you if you're not immediately their best friend. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, that's that can be a little weird, weird if people do know uh, more about you than them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird power dynamic, you know, because it's almost like, oh yeah, cool, but you don't want to. And I mean, you've heard horror stories from both sides. You've or heard, people want to grab a drink after every show. And yeah. It's like, oh, I just came here to work. Yeah. Uh, I really need to get home and work more. Mm-hmm. But they want to grab a drink. That's, yeah. No, yeah. we're buddies. I've listened to you for the past two yeah. years. It's like, yeah. yeah, there's. And you want to give that because that's why you're doing it. You want mm-hmm. like here, it, what's at, at its highest, right? What we're trying to do is connect with people, mm-hmm. right? And and uh, I think if you actually like take away all the cynics and all the people who go to cynicism, we are somehow in our weird way trying to make the world a little bit better mm-hmm. or like, you know. Um, in this instance, shed a little light on maybe some social problems that mm-hmm. we've got, or just like bring joy, laughter to the world. Yeah. But but um, we kind of want to do that on our own terms because when it comes at you in a way that's a little uncomfortable in terms of the power dynamic, where someone's like glassy eyed and they're like, "Hey, dude, hey, do you want to go for a beer?" You're just like, "Um, yeah, dude. I mean, give, can I give you a hug and just say that thank you for being?" But I really gotta go because like. You're coming at me with a way too much positive energy. That I, <laughs> I only have, I'm spent. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. It's also funny, like when you're dealing with people who are like, uh, like kind of like yes men to you. Oh, where they're just. I haven't like, got them yet. I'm not at your level. <laughs> no, people no, 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 Frank, get away from me. <laughs> no, but I'm talking about like if you have like a buddy or something that's like, yeah, you're what you're doing is this, this, this. Uh. Do you ever, and like... I keep my friend John around. Yeah, like your friend John? Yeah, he keeps me humble. (laughs) Like, I don't know where John is at this moment. Probably enjoying Korean barbecue uh, down the street. But, (laughs) yeah. Uh, So, but it's weird. So, like, this is something that that I've had to deal with. And maybe, I don't know if you've ever experienced this in your life. But uh, do you know, like, about imposter syndrome? Uh, No, but tell me. So, imposter syndrome is kind of feeling like, you know, if somebody does come up to you and say, like, hey, man, that was such a great show, blah, blah, blah. But in your heart, you kind of know, like, you think, like, who is this person? Like, to, like, why would this person come up to me? Like, I'm nothing special. I'm nothing this. I'm nothing. Like, you almost feel like an imposter. Yeah. Like, in your own area. So, like, in comedy, for instance, um, if I do a show at a club, I'm lucky enough to get a spot. I'm always grateful for any spot that I get. Um, but I look around in the green room and it's everybody's like 10 years older than me, blah, blah, mm. blah. And then I st- immediately start thinking like, well, why am I here? Oh, yeah. You know? Well, that, that I think, um, well, first of all, I think we all feel like that, mm-hmm. uh, especially in the earlier stages because mm-hmm. it's so goddamn hard to mm-hmm. do stand-up comedy. Yeah. But then um, it's like the first time you call yourself, oh, I'm a comedian. When you say that out loud, you start stepping into yourself and becoming your own uh, – you become a comedian, right? Mm-hmm. And then as you move forward, your confidence builds and then uh, you realize that, oh, I'm not in competition with any of these people in the room. Mm-hmm. I'm on my own journey. Uh, there's a chance in five years from now that I'll either be way better or way worse than them. And none of that matters. Mm-hmm. Like, so 
the only thing that really matters in this in this stand up comedy world is like uh, creating new content that makes people laugh and then this perception of um like you're not worthy i mean that doesn't really matter you just have to perform at the highest level that you can yeah and lo and behold you probably can make it all the way to the top if you put in the hours yeah or you go for a 500 mile walk up the coast yeah <laughs> one of them yeah well, one of them uh I remember- I'm, I'm sorry i just i just think dude that imposter syndrome it's it's very real it happens to everyone mm-hmm. but, but the real thing is just like if you want something just go for it yeah. take it don't step on anyone to get there and realize there's no competition except between you and yourself yeah and then you know just know that it's gonna come you put in the hours you get the results it's like that's guaranteed and that's been proven to me many times proven to me in, in the army in business and now i think hopefully in the next few years in comedy yeah and i think it's it's important too to give yourself credit like whenever yeah. you do something and like take time to kind of like accept like you know it's weird if I feel like not enough people like really self reflect, you know, like on what they're doing and stuff and try to like tie it back and be like, oh, yeah, no, I do deserve that or I do get that or I do, you know, do that. But I think, I mean, one of the biggest examples of just, you know, doing what you want to do is that walk <laughs> that you're going to do yeah. because, I mean, how many people have come out and said like, you're crazy <laughs> for, for wanting to do this? Hey, do you know what? Lots. But do you know what's more common? Mm-hmm. People going, dude, I can't get that idea in my head. I would love to go walking and do that stuff. And people want to come along and join. And I think that's because because we're all human, first of all, and we all have these archetypal stories in our heads. And walking and a journey uh, into the unknown and coming out hopefully successful at the far end is an archetypal story that every human has in their brain structure. Mm -hmm. So when I say I'm going for a walk, I don't know how it's going to turn out and it's pretty dangerous, but I'm going to try it anyway. Everyone's little brain goes, oh, that's kind of cool. You know? Yeah. And uh, that was a happy accident. And I'm pretty excited that that's tapping into that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're getting that freedom. Yeah. And that's yeah, what, yeah. I mean, everybody's tied to the system. Like you were talking earlier about the system, kind of yeah. like operating in that system. And like you said, in like Mexico, but even like overall, like in the US, there's a system that everybody's tied to. Yeah. And I feel like everybody always wants to just hit that reset button, you yeah. know, or just wants to go out and do something crazy. Well, yeah, dude, it's a, what is it, 30 days with no responsibilities other than creating content, meeting new people and having a laugh. Yeah. And the price I have to pay is that I have to walk 25 miles a day and sleep rough. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the end of this, as long as I come out alive, dude, uh-huh. I'm going to have a much better understanding of the world and know a lot more people. Yeah. I mean, what more could I ask for? Yeah. I couldn't do that probably any other way quicker in a month. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think I could meet that many people and have that many experiences in a month except doing this. So I think it's a good vehicle for uh, personal growth. Yeah, no, and for sure. Hopefully we'll get some stories. I'll be able to yeah, man. <laughs> try and write a book, do a TED Talk, all that. That would be hilarious <laughs> if the whole walk was just boring. <laughs> It was oh, just yeah. like a walk. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it could be boring. <laughs> so that's the other risk. It won't be. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll already tell you. It's not yeah. going to be. So uh, how how prepared do you feel for it? Uh, mentally, uh, mentally, I'm good because uh, I'm being in the military at a relatively high level of tension, stress, fatigue, <laughs> and uh, pain uh, for quite a prolonged period of time, I know I can uh, handle the physical side of it and the mental side of it. Uh, In terms of the unknown, not knowing how this will be received, will it, will people come out and collaborate? Um, Will I get a response when I get to LA that is worthy of the effort that I tried to put in? Like, because I'm going to give this my all. Mm-hmm. If I get to LA and people just go, yeah, well done, Frank. That might hurt, but maybe that's the lesson that I have to do this for. Maybe it's like, do it. So what I'm trying to do, and my friend said this to me, do it for yourself. Mm-hmm. Do it from a place of uh, of uh, love. <laughs> do, it for, do it for the experience in and of itself and uh, watch how the world just, uh, you know, pays attention. I've noticed, um, I've noticed the more truth you speak as well. Mm-hmm. the more people actually pay attention. Right. And uh, as a result, I wrote this line the other day, um, which I'm pretty happy about, is, uh, is uh, truth has a gravity so strong that when you speak it, it pulls people in. So when I'm out there, no matter how I'm feeling, I'm going to try and communicate to the camera, the podcast, and in these storytelling moments, the truth. And I have a feeling that that will tap in 
to the power of the universe. And by the time I get here, there'll be so much truth coming out of this mouth that people will have to, uh, that I'll be able to help people understand themselves a bit better. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what's so I I assume this is this is um, am I just talking shit? No, <laughs> you haven't mentioned John once. Yeah. So the, there's this is something that John and I, I hope it's coming over. I I think it will come over like over the audio. But even just sitting here with you and and we didn't know each other before this podcast. No. You know, like we literally sat down. Somebody else books the show, so like he booked yeah. it. He said this is, it. and I was like, oh, this is an interesting guy. We're gonna talk. It's gonna be cool. But the level of genuineness that like you speak with and that like you have towards this, like that's, that's the key. You know, there's there, I bet there's people thinking about it like in LA probably at this moment, I should go on a 500 mile walk. I'm going to get so many followers. I'm going to get some, but they're doing it kind of for the wrong reason. You know, yeah. the fact that you really seem genuine about this walk and like the purpose behind it. And not only that, you also did attach a charity to it. Hopefully yeah. everything gets signed off on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, I think you're going to be very successful with it. Thanks, like, man. Here, here's the thing. I, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I was aware that there's a hook to this mm -hmm. and that there's a very good chance that it'll get media attention. Mm -hmm. I'm not stupid. Yeah. I'm doing this because I'm going to be dead in 50 years. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can do it. I can probably cultivate a career out of it mm -hmm. and I can help people along the way. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone has a problem with that, yeah. Call me. <laughs> Say why you have a problem with that and then re-examine why you're upset about that. Mm -hmm. My goal is to have the best 50 more years on this planet, help as many people as I can, reduce as much suffering in the world as I can, and tell some jokes along the way. That is it. Man, that that is that is so refreshing to hear, especially in this industry. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. like being out I'm here. I'm also sick of being broke. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I would. <laughs> I could imagine that's another thing. Well, that's why you shouldn't have spent all your money in Mexico. Uh, so, true, uh, true. Well, Frank, we're we're coming towards the conclusion of the podcast, man. Yes, and definitely. So, as Ron G has always said, there's no small talk here, and I don't yeah. think we did any small talk. No, really. I think maybe we, maybe I wasn't. Sometimes uh, we should have dropped more laughs or something. Should right. We, should we have been funnier? <laughs> this is a very serious podcast. It yeah. just involves comedians. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, I mean, I just love coming in here and talking about life and having those kinds of discussions because as it's funny, we were talking about oversharing. Yeah. I feel like this is, we're, we're literally oversharing, but it's almost like purposeful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very aware that some people listen to this will go, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, listen to that. But that's cynicism. The heart, like. Cynicism's easy. Yeah. Try and do something. Yeah. Try and actually make the world better. Yeah. <laughs> and I say this as if I know what I'm doing, but like I'll, I'm, I'm trying. I'm yeah. trying. And uh, there's a very good chance I'll fail, but I, I, I'll be trying. And you can follow it on Facebook, Twitter, yeah. Instagram, Francis Cronin. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we, we always end every show with a, a few rapid fire questions. Oh, brilliant. Um, and these are, so just answer whatever comes to mind. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep them short. Um, but the first question is, if you could get coffee with somebody dead or alive, who would it be? You, dude. Be me? Yeah. Continue this conversation. I can see it's be a fruitful relationship. Yeah. I'm I'm with it. John would look very disappointed in the corner. <laughs> he was like, you didn't say me. Yeah. yeah uh, I'd get coffee with John. Yeah. Maybe actually, truth, truthfully, apart from you, I wouldn't mind getting to know my granddad a bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not around. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was a cool dude. He was an adventurous guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of the, I might have picked up some of his genetics. Yeah. He's got absolutely. some cool stories I'd like to have heard more about. Yeah. yeah. I feel like uh, so many things skip a generation of like, you know, kind of like that that adventure oh, yeah. nature that he must have had that like you're kind of emulating him. It's, it's yeah, great. It's, it's probably, I'm probably a little hardwired to it mm -hmm. and programmed to do weird stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. And yeah. Uh, so what smell reminds you of home? Oh, cooking bacon. Which bacon. I do as regularly as I can. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Although I've been cutting weight for this mm -hmm. so I don't have to carry 15 extra kilograms so I haven't been eating bacon that often go, this week go keto just nothing but bacon oh yeah, oh, yeah. That's, that's the way yeah yeah yeah. why not just eat a bit I, I, yeah. <laughs> just eat a big brick of bacon I'm kind of yeah. like really that's a diet all right cool <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that um if you weren't a comic what would your career be um anthropologist going around talking to people and uh learning about them. Mm -hmm. I just like that. Yeah. If I didn't have to chase a paycheck, all I would do is travel around, going into jungles, trying to learn how to yeah. be, <laughs> I have, learn about people. 
I have fifty dollars that history was your favorite subject in school. Oh, history? Yeah. Oh, I'll, well, I'll let you keep your history, <laughs> but I, I liked, uh, I liked anthropology, which mm -hmm. I had, uh, obviously was in history. Yeah. Yeah. And art. I did the art, you know, painting and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, well, I come from an LA public school. <laughs> so it was oh, all, yeah, lumped, yeah, yeah. all lumped into one. <laughs> That's cool. Um, all right. And I have one last question. I'll take that. 50. Um, and yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's, so this is my favorite question to yeah. ask. Um, and this will be the last one. Uh, if you could go back in time and give barely starting you a piece of advice as in, you know, you're just starting comedy or, um, what would it be? What would that piece of advice be? Don't look outside of yourself. Trust your own judgment mm -hmm. and be as truthful and kind to people as you can be and watch how your world gets better. Yeah. The more I do those things, the better my world gets. Do you feel like it's changed since you first started? Yeah, because when you're when you're starting out, you're so insecure that you're not really sure how the, the social dynamics and the scene work and blah, blah, blah. And I remember just thinking, oh, this is too much work trying to be like cool and all this stuff. And then, and then I realized I didn't really try. That's the truth. And then I realized, oh, just by me being myself and kind of normal and not trying to be a hero, people are like, oh, he's all right. And then doors open. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's it. I think just being yourself and not trying to be uh, a hero gets you way further in Hollywood because everyone's sick of everyone trying to be a hero here. They mm -hmm. just want someone they can hang around with and have a conversation with like mm -hmm. this, you know? Yeah. Everybody's trying to be the lead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. What it is. Absolute truth, dude. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, so the rough set, which is the 500 mile walk uh, from San Francisco to LA, uh, where can everybody keep up with that? Yeah, please. Uh, let me just hammer home <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, Francis Cronin. Or you can just check out hashtag rough set, R-O-U-G-H-S-E-T. And uh, actually, if anyone wants to pick up a little article that mentions it today, you can pick it up in the Irish Voice in New York City. It's nice. uh, at all the newsstands. Nice. Yeah. And uh, where's I'm I'm curious for the GPS. <laughs> or the, the GPS? GPS well, right now I, I reached out to a few GPS tracking companies, but the only one that I've got a response from uh, was myself. So none of them got back. <laughs> to, so what I'll be doing is I'll be uh, posting my pins on Twitter every few hours, so okay. people know where I am. They can come out, walk beside. Uh, do a podcast or walk with me for a few miles, hang out, whatever they want to do. That's awesome. Well, I hope bring everybody... Bring me a sandwich, if, uh, bacon. <laughs> <laughs> bacon sandwich. Bring yeah. that bacon sandwich. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I hope everybody listening, uh, if you don't live, uh, you know, in the middle of the state or anywhere, I hope everybody, you know, pops out and keeps up with you on social media. And then Thanks, I hope there's a big reception party for you here when you get back to LA. Yeah. Because we're excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited, man. Going to get to meet loads of nice people. Awesome. Frank Cronin. Thank you.